الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على النبي الأمي العربي القرشي المكي المدني الهاشمي صاحب قاب قوسين محبوب رب المشرقين والمغربين جد الحسن والحسين النبي الحرمين والإمام القبلتين والرسول الثقلين الذين سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بالقاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الماء سومين المظلومين المنتخبين المنتجبين لا سيما بقية الله في العرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء واللعنة الدائمة الباقية على عدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم وغاصب حقوقهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه تبارك وتعالى في محكم كتابه ومتقن خطابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فسقى لهما ثم تولى إذا إلى الظل فقال رب إني لما أنزلت إلي من خير فقير رسالة صلاة محمد وآل محمد this evening is with regards to two great prophets of Allah and their meeting with one another, the circumstances of how they met um, and the important lessons that we derive from that particular story. So I'll quickly list the, the lessons that we'll get from the story then inshallah when we go into detail into the story, we'll be able to look at how we will get those, those lessons. Now the first important lesson um, that we get is related to what we spoke about yesterday. And that is for a person to do whatever action that they do only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this story gives us, in the most beautiful manner, gives us the insight into what happens what kind of result is achieved when a person does something solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second important lesson after that <coughs> is with regards to trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all your affairs, in every single thing that I do, not only do I only do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever result he's going to bring for me in my life will be better for me even if at this moment in time I cannot see the wisdom and the benefit in it for me. The third important lesson, very important, that's very relevant to our lives today that is derived from this particular story is that of the importance of haya of ghira and of hijab in general um, and the fourth is that when a person trusts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when a person does his action solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when a person observes these laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what a beautiful result and what a beautiful outcome he manages to achieve which is highlighted in this particular story. Those of you who are familiar with the Holy Quran and may have guessed from the verse that I've recited and maybe the 
insights that I've given or the hints that I've given for the story will know that I'm talking about the story of the meeting of Musa alayhi salam with Shu'ayb alayhi salam. And that the context of how it's mentioned the Holy Quran, Surah Al-Qasas, is that Musa alayhi salatu wasalam had come to the aid of one of his followers, whom in the Holy Quran is called his Shia. Um, and as a result of defending his follower, he had killed the person from, from the people of the Pharaoh. And he was very scared, he was very afraid that he's killed one person from the people of the Pharaoh. And now the Pharaoh is going to hunt him out and kill him. So one of the people comes from the Pharaoh and says to him, that I advise you that you leave this place and go far away so that the Pharaoh does not find you. So Musa alayhi salam leaves and he goes, he starts traveling. Of course, we're talking about travel of at least 6,000 years ago where there's no pit stops on the way and there's no service stations, nothing. Once you, if you're on a journey and you run out of supplies, that's it. So the tafsir mentions that Musa alayhi salam has been traveling for a long time, having left his hometown. And for at least three days, he hasn't eaten at all. He hasn't had any food at all. He's been surviving on eating plants and leaves and whatever he can find on the way until he arrives in this place which is which the Quran refers to as as Madian today it's in the Baghdad protectorate of Iraq some hundred miles northwest of the capital so he arrives there and when he arrives in this place he the Quran tells us he sees a well and of course, this, this well is important because he's been traveling for a long time, he hasn't eaten, he hasn't had anything to drink, and now he's discovered a well. So this is particularly significant. When he gets to this well, he sees that there is a long queue of people there collecting water and getting water for their animal for their cattle as well. And he also notices at the same time that there are two girls there on the side um, who also have their own cattle. But they're waiting on the side, they're not here in the queue with everybody else. So he goes up to them and he asks them how come they're waiting there away from everybody else. So they reply to him and they say to him that we have to wait until everybody is gone and the reason why we are here, they offer the explanation, they say the reason why we are here is because our father is an old man and we are the only people who can do this for him. So Musa alayhi salatu salam, what does he do? He helps to water their cattle. It's mentioned in various tafasir from the school of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam that the, the bucket that was in the well was so heavy that it required, uh, some narratives says two people, some says seven people, some says forty people to lower it and bring it back up again. And Musa alayhi salam did this by himself. He didn't take assistance from anybody else. He went in to the, to near, near to the well and he said to the people who were feeding there and giving water to their cattle, he said, I will give water to your cattle and I need to give water to the cattle of these young girls as well. 
So in any case, he goes, he takes this, the bucket down by himself and he brings it back up again himself. And thus he completes the watering of all the animals there and of these two young girls as well. So the first lesson from this particular part of the story is, as we mentioned yesterday, the greatest level of a person's action is to do the right thing regardless of whether they're going to get any, there's any incentive in that action or not. Of course, Musa alayhi salam has never met these girls in his life before. He doesn't know who they are. He doesn't ask them who they are either. And he only does this because he believes it's the right thing to do. He helps them water their flock because he believes this is the right thing to do. When he does so and they leave, when they arrive home, now, if you arrive home every day at 5 o'clock, everybody is expecting you to come home at 5 o'clock. If you come home early, the first question you're going to be asked is, why did you come home early? Now, this watering of the flock this was a regular occurrence, you used to do it every day. And every day they would have to wait for all the groups of people who are watering their flocks to leave before they would start to water their own. And therefore they would come back at a later time. Today they'd come back early. When they came back early, Shu'aib salam asked them, why did you come back early? What happened today that allowed you to come back early? So one of them says, that at the well we met a young man who assisted us, who helped us in this matter. And surely he is strong and he's trustworthy. In the tafsir, this is obviously the ayat of the Quran, or Surah Al-Qasas, verse number 23 onwards. In the tafsir it mentions, from Imam Musa al-Qadim alayhi salatu wa salam. That Shu'ayb alayhi salam asks his daughters, or the one who had said this, that I understand that you think that he's strong, because he picked up this bucket that people were not able to pick up, and he did it by himself. But what makes you say that he's trustworthy? What makes you say that he's Amin? So she replies. She says, the reason why I've said this is because when I... So he sends her back. He says, go and bring him back. When he... When they come back, then they have this conversation about strength and trustworthiness. So Shu'aib asks, he says, why do you think he's trustworthy? What is, it about his, what is it about him that made you think this? So she says, when you send me back to bring him, I was walking in front because I was leading the way. But there was a gust of wind. And he told me to stop. And he said to me, I'll walk in front and you'll walk behind me. And wherever there's a turning, you will throw a stone so that I'll know where to turn. He says, why did he do that? He gave Musa alayhi salam, gave a reason as well. He says, because we're not from a community where we observe the, the women from behind. So she says, I, that for this reason I considered him trustworthy because he took care of the hijab. He took care of his own hijab. In any case, so he comes when Musa alayhi salam arrives in presence of Hazrat al-Shu'ayb. Hazrat al-Shu'ayb offers him 
food. Now, we have to come back to the context. Musa alayhi salam has been traveling for a long time and he hasn't eaten for many days. When he's offered the food, you give somebody hungry, who is hungry food. I don't know the case with you guys. If I'm hungry, someone gives me food, even if it's not good, I'll say it's good. Because I'm hungry. And this, at this moment in time, this person has given me food that I need it. Musa alayhi salam, what does he do? He says to Hazrat Shaib, he says, that this good deed that I did, I didn't do it for any kind of reward. I did not do this good deed of helping your daughters because I wanted some kind of reward from you. Shu'ayb says that this feeding of, this me feeding you is not a reward for what you did. This me feeding you is my own generosity. I want to feed you because you, you did this. You, you showed this act of kindness. It's not, this is not a reward. It's not a payment for what you did. But particularly, you have to come back to this point about, about haya, about khaira, and about hijab in general. Because this is very important in this particular story, and it's very relevant to our lives. Because, the only reason that Musa alayhi salam get, comes into this position of presenting himself in front of Shu'ayb alayhi salam and then whatever transpires afterward, which we'll come to in a moment. The only reason he gets into this position is because he's observed the, the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that he should. For a person in today's society, Whenever they ask questions about this, this particular area, and they say that I'm trying to do X, Y, and Z, I'm trying to achieve this kind of spirituality in my life, where am I going wrong? What do I need to do in order to become more spiritual? The buzzword of today is becoming more spiritual. What do I need to do in order to become more spiritual, more elevated, what do I need to do in order to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The answer is very easy. The answer is that I have to follow the laws that he set out. If I want to become spiritual, if I want to increase my spirituality, then the way to do so is to follow the sharia, is to follow the commands of halal and haram, and in doing so, I will become more spiritual. There's no magic formula, success, ta'weez, du'a that will make you spiritual if a person is not observing those halal and haram. And this story highlights to us in the most magnificent way how just observing that wajib of the hijab that applies to men and women, Musa alayhi salam has gone from this position where he's under threat of his own life to such a glorious position that he's going to achieve in just a moment that we'll mention. And this is particularly important in today's day and age because not only we have different kinds of interactions, not only do we have this interaction, um, the physical kind of interaction that we have with each other, but also, of course, the, the greatest curse of our era is social media and our social media interactions. And in our social media interactions, sometimes we let the guard down. And we think perhaps because it's not a physical interaction, it's okay. We can let the guard down. No. In order to observe that correct kind of haya, it's important that on social media, our guard should be up as well, just as it would have been in person, just as our guard would have been up, just as we would have been observing those rules, if we were physically meeting that person. Similarly, on social media, our conduct 
should be consistent with that and should not become inconsistent just because there's a computer or there's a phone in the middle. No, on the other side, I remember when the internet was still new to people and people used to go into chat rooms and discuss with other people whom they didn't know. The rules at the beginning when you used to sign up to the chat room, they always used to remind you that don't forget that on the other side there's a real person. Don't think for a moment that just because there's a computer or phone in between you that there isn't a, a real person on the other side. And that reminder is obviously that was reminder was for security reasons or for safety reasons, but it's a reminder also for a person who's a Muslim and wants to observe these rules that remember on the other side there's there is a real person. And that means that observing those rules of hijab just as you would have observed them in person, just as we would observe them if that person was physically in front of us. So Musa alayhi salam observes haya, but also the daughters of Shu'ayb alayhi salam also observe haya. The Quran speaks of them that they were observing haya by waiting and not, uh, not interacting with the men there that they didn't know. And that they were waiting patiently for the men to leave in order for them to water their flock. So both sides demonstrated their haya, demonstrated their modesty, demonstrated their commitment to the hijab. And the old Prophet of Islam says, Man la haya, la, la deen la. Whoever doesn't have haya has no religion. That means that this is particularly, particularly significant. That when we have interaction with other people, we know where to draw the line. Where to, we know where to stop, where to limit our interactions with different people, whether it's people from the other gender or the people from our own same gender. And just because something that we happen to be doing is halal and is the right thing. We're not speaking about things which are haram. That which is haram is obviously out of the, out of the picture. That has already been told by Sharia to refrain from. But even if somebody's done something halal, there's certain things that haya necessitates for us to keep personal. It's not necessary for me to go out and share those details and share that information with other people. And it would be contrary to the haya for me to go out and tell people about my halal interactions as well. Therefore, it's imperative to remember that that is how significant haya is in the religion of Islam. So now when he comes, first of all, Shu'ayb salam assures him that he's safe in this land of Madian. He's far away from, far enough away from the Pharaoh that he's safe. The Pharaoh will not reach there. Then he gives him, gives him an offer based on what his daughter had said to him. His daughter said what? He said that, give him a reward because he is strong and he is trustworthy. So Shu'ayb salam says that I want you to marry one of my daughters. I want you to marry one of my daughters. But the condition is that you will serve me for eight years. And if you want, add two more years. <coughs> to those eight to make it ten. Musa alayhi salam says, I agree to your terms. And after that they, they got married. This is another significant lesson from this particular story. In our cultures, 
particularly in the East. There is a stigma against a son-in-law working for his father-in-law. Say, ghar damad ban gaya hai. Right? But Musa alayhi salam is the Ulul Azam prophet. And he's become ghar damad. Shu'ayb alayhi salam has said to him, you work for me. And on that condition I will have you get married to your, you can marry one of my daughters. In the tafsir it's mentioned, clarified that it's the same daughter who had expressed these sentiments regarding him. And it's the same daughter whom Shu'ayb salam had sent to get Musa salam to come towards him. But also it shows us that if a person is doing something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a person is doing this only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has put his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward him magnificently. Musa alayhi salam in his wildest dreams could not have imagined that he would have come to this stage. And of course he had not done this action in order to receive any kind of reward or benefit. But because his action was solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah rewards him in this, in this way. So he works there and then it's, again the tafsir tells us that he works there for the, the whole 10 years. Once the 10 years are complete, he leaves the presence of Shu'ayb alayhi salam and then he goes back towards towards his original hometown, goes back towards Egypt. On the way back towards Egypt, now the Quran tells us, on the way back towards Egypt, he, from the distance, sees the fire. When he sees the fire, he tells his family to wait. He says that, let me go and get some heat from that fire because we're feeling cold. When he goes towards that fire there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses him. And he's ordained with the prophethood. When he's ordained with the prophethood, of course, then he comes back to his family and then he goes towards the Pharaoh in order to preach to him the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of this he receives as a blessing for having acted in the most proper manner in order to in order to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah. He did not have any vested interest in uh, helping those those girls, those daughters of Shu'ayb alayhi salam. And nor did he have any vested interest of getting any kind of reward. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him, rewarded him on the basis of his intent of helping them. Now, a few more lessons that we get from, that, from this particular incident is that Shu'ayb alayhi salatu salam had sent out his daughters because he was old. So, there's no objection from the religious from the Shari'i point of view for women going out. Some people use the religion to try and justify people saying that the women shouldn't go out. No, Shu'ayb is a prophet and he had sent out his daughters to do this work as long as the rules of Haya are observed. There's no objection from the religion of Islam for a person to go out as a man or a woman as long as the rules of Haya are observed. Both Musa alayhi salam observes this rule and so do the daughters of Shu'ayb alayhi salam. What well, also particularly is that sometimes there's people who try and use the religion of Islam to defend their own ideas which are not anything to do with Islam. For example, about six months ago, even less than that, there was a famous... Uh, guy who preaches on TV who 
re remain nameless, um, said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't mentioned any women in the Quran by name because he doesn't like to talk about women. Strange kind of argument that was presented. But I remember when I was preparing for this lecture, I thought to myself that here are two prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are being introduced to us through their women. We meet the daughters of Shu'aib in this story before we meet Shu'aib alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam, while he's being introduced, is being introduced by his mother before he's even born. So these two great prophets are being introduced to us in the Quran through the women. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't like women, if for whatever reason, why would this uh, kind of introduction take place? Well, finally, we observe in this story the importance of not only doing things only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only putting your trust only in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also always doing the right thing. And that eventually a person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would not abandon the person who does the right thing because it's the right thing. And no other interest. There's no interest of reward or, or any fear of punishment or anything like that. Musa alayhi salam, what state did he start off from and what state does he end in? He started off from the state that he was fearful of his life and he ends in the state that he's received prophethood and the order to go back to that same place in order to preach the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of this as a result of one action, but that action is so great that it was done only and solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At this moment, it's perhaps fitting to mention that on the final day of his life, Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salatu salam was visited. Was visited by a very prominent companion of his, Sa'sa ibn Sohan. And Sa'sa ibn Sohan comes to the Imam and he says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, I want to ask you a question. This is the day after he's struck by Islam al on the 20th of the month of Ramadan. Imam says, Ask me. So Sa'sa ibn Sohan asks, it's a very long tradition, asks him about his comparison with various prophets. When he asks him, the Imam والسلام, mentions a general principle, qaida kulliya. And then he begins answering his question. Sa'sa ibn Sohan says, to, Imam says to Sa'sa, for a person to praise themselves is not liked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah does not like a person to praise themselves. But because you've asked me this question, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, This is to the Holy Prophet of Islam with regards to Amirul Mu'min alayhi in this Surah Al-Insha'Allah, he says, and about the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tell the people. And when the Imam was asked, what is this ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Prophet was ordered to tell people, he says, the wilayat of Amirul Mu'min alayhi salam. So Imam says that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this command, that when it comes to the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then tell people, so I'm answering your question. So he asks him about the comparison with Adam and Nuh and Ibrahim, and then he asks him about the comparison with Musa alayhi salam. And Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salam reminds Sa'ad ibn Sohan of this particular incident in Musa alayhi salam's life. He says, Sa'sa, 
we call in the Holy Quran that when Musa salam is ordained as a prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, go towards the Pharaoh and preach to him the message of Allah. Go towards the Pharaoh and preach to him the message of Allah. Musa salam says, what to Allah? He says, oh Allah, I'm scared because I killed one person from the people of the Pharaoh. So send with me Harun as my brother and my supporter and my aid in this matter. I feel afraid to go alone in the course of the Pharaoh because I killed one person from there. Amirul Mu'min salam says, but I, Amirul Mu'min, on the day of the announcement of Bara'a, the announcement of disassociation, what happened in the ninth year of Hijrah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Bara'a to the Holy Prophet of Islam. It's the ninth Surah of the Quran and the only one that begins without Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim when it was revealed, the Holy Prophet of Islam entrusted it to a particular person and told him to go and recite these verses. While that person was still on the way towards Mecca, Jibreel came down and said, Ya Rasulullah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that either you go and recite it or somebody from you, minkum, goes to recite. So the Holy Prophet Islam sent Amir al to recite the surah. He says, so, so when I went to recite that surah in Makkah, there was not a single household from which I had not killed at least one person. In Makkah, there was not a single household from which I had not killed at least one person. But yet I went there by myself. I was all alone. And I recited those verses saying, Allah and His Messenger disassociate with from you, do bara'a from you and give you this order that you have four months to Leave this, leave Masjid al-Haram because this is only for, for Muslims. He says, I did that and I was all alone. Therefore, I am greater than Musa salam because Musa salam had killed one person and he said, I won't go to the Pharaoh alone. Yet I had killed at least one person from every household in Mecca and yet I when all alone to make this announcement. In any case, the greater lesson, and as to summarize our discussion from this particularly important story, is reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the outcome of our affairs, is to act in accordance with what is the right thing without any incentive of reward or punishment and most importantly to observe haya to observe the correct hijab to observe the right laws of the religion of islam within our lives in order to receive spiritual elevation and also worldly benefits what musa alayhi salam received as a benefit was not only prophethood but also a worldly benefit as well in terms of employment, in terms of getting married. And that the lesson from Musa alayhi story here and his action is that people come and say, you know, I'm struggling to find a job, or I'm struggling to get married. But the solution is do the hard work, but make sure you come back, reflect on your own self, and reflect on myself and find out whether I'm 
observing the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the correct way or not. Whether my actions are sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. And if they're not, then that, that is what I need to rectify in order to make sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps me in this pathway in my life. But the greatest and significant, most significant event of relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of doing action solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and for observing the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making sure those laws are not violated is what Imam does. Yesterday we mentioned that. He said, I don't want the city of my grandfather being violated with my blood. When he arrived in Mecca, he learns of the news. He's obviously, he's come to Mecca to perform. His intent of coming to Mecca is to perform the Hajj. But when he comes to Mecca and he learns of the news that Yazid is planning to send people in Ihram to kill him while in the precincts of the Haram. The grandson of the Holy Prophet of Islam says, I will abandon the Hajj. But I will not let the Haram be violated by the shedding of my blood. And I always say this. That can you imagine if the grandson of the Holy Prophet of Islam had been killed in the precincts of the Haram? What would have happened? To the day of judgment, people would have been saying to each other, How can we go to the house of God when the grandson of the Prophet went there and he was not safe? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna awwala baytin wudi'a lil nas lilladhi bi bakkatin mubaraka wa hudan lil alameen. Fihi ayatun bayinat. Maqamu Ibrahim wa man dakhalahu kana amina. Whoever enters into this has become safe. Imam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I want to make sure that that stays true. I've abandoned the hajj. Somebody should have said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, shariat came from your house. Who knows better than you that once you've put on the ihram for hajj, you can't leave? But he say, you know, I've abandoned this hajj so that until the day of judgment, hajj might stay alive. I've abandoned one hajj to make sure that until the day of judgment, people can still go to hajj with the knowledge and the safety that their lives will not be violated that they will not be killed, that they will really have sanctuary in the house of God because Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam saved that bloodshed from happening there. Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam saved the bloodshed from happening. And instead he says that remember I will write the course of history in such a way, in such a way that historians would be forced to relate my narrative and not the narrative that they want to relate. What is my narrative? My narrative is that I will choose the place where I'm killed. My narrative is that I will choose the time and the day that I am killed. My narrative is that even though I'll be killed in the desert, my story of my killing will reach the furthest places in the world. It's mentioned that when the first of Muharram would come, Imam Radha says about his father, he says that my father would be in a changed state, he would wear black clothes, and he would not be seen smiling anymore until the tenth day would come where he would remove his ammama, he would be barefooted, he would be bareheaded, and he would be so distressed on the day of Ashura about the killing of his grandfather Hussain Another narrative states that in Medina, 
the people of Medina used to say, we wouldn't sight the moon of Muharram. No, instead we would just wait for the sound of wailing to come from the house of Imam Sadiq, and we would know that the moon of Muharram had been sighted. The sound of wailing and the sound of crying would come, and we would know that the moon of Muharram has been sighted. We would know that the red flag has come down and the black flag has been raised. We would know that the season for mourning has arrived. We would know that Hussain alayhi salatu memory is going to be really a figure.